So let's start with a question. How do you go from being a young guy living in Leicester, England, studying for your PhD to a sought after international expert on mass violence living here in America and owning the country's largest database of mass shooters? Well, stick with me to find out. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm Simon Osmo, and on my channel, I'll share with you a story that will educate, inform and inspire to help you live a life of significance. Today, this is part one of my conversation. I'm talking with Dr. James Densley, an international expert on street gangs, co-founder of The Violence Project, TEDx speaker, writer for CNN, The Guardian, LA Times, USA Today, and The Wall Street Journal, as well as an author of several highly acclaimed books on street crime. But most importantly, one of my good friends and fellow Brit here in Minnesota. But before we get into the content, if you get value, please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell to be told every time I release a new inspiring video. So let's dive into this week's conversation with Dr. James Densley. So James Densley, welcome to the Who Became podcast. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. And um, I should say Dr. James Densley, but we're too informal because we're friends. So, uh, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, just James is just fine. And now, you know, I was thinking about James, um, was it last week or a couple of weeks ago? No, no, we're going to do his podcast. I was thinking about the first time that we, we met. And it was surrounding that, you know, me being English in America, you being English in America. A guy tried to connect us and you were going to come to my office at Mall of America. And I was thinking... Do I really want to meet this English guy? <laughs> you know, I, I want to be the only one here in the US. You know, I can remember that you, you turned up and we instantly hit it off. But, yeah. Um, you know, I know our, the, the listeners of the show are going to sort of see some of the chemistry, but, you know, you're, you're a good friend, a good guy, and it's great to have you have you on. I appreciate that. Yeah, and it's funny. I think the same thing. When I was first meeting you, it was one of those situations of like, oh, look, it's an English guy with an English accent. You should meet the other English guy with an exactly. English accent. Yes. And I thought, really? Are yeah. we going to have to play that game? Yeah. Um, and you go into those things a little reluctantly. And then, of course, we just hit it off from uh, from the very first second, and and you know the rest is sort of history. So well, it's I can been a remember pleasure. for you know I've got um, various different listeners to the show. I've got people in the Middle East that listen to this podcast, oh, wow. um, to people in the US and people in the UK. It's really cool when you see the the geographical um, location. But so, some people won't get the relevance of this. But in my office, I had I think it was a Sun newspaper from the liquid bomb terrorism plot, and it was you know, I can remember you made some joke about you know it was like this liquid bomb terrorism plot, and at the very bottom it said like and Bex is dropped on the England <laughs> soccer team or something like. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it and it was one of those things as well i think you know sometimes you miss home and it was being in your office and just seeing something as silly as the sun newspaper on yeah. the wall was just kind of this reminiscence of uh of being back home again and so it was a nice way to sort of kick the conversation off and yeah and get started now james i know so you're known for various different things and maybe we'll, we'll touch on uh briefly about what you're known for in the us and then i want to sort of go back to your time in england but you know you've got your doctorate from oxford university of england uh, you emigrated here around the same sort of time as me, 2010? Uh, yeah, that's right. 2010 yeah. when you come over. You are now a British American. I'm not uh, there yet. Right. So you're, that's right. You're British American. I'm legit. Yeah. yeah. And you've got the Violence Project and you're a sort of a, a, a professor of criminology at Metropolitan State University. So maybe you'll just give us a snapshot around what you do here in the US and then we'll dive back to your time in England. Yeah, thanks. No, I'd say, so my, my sort of day job, I guess, and my, and my main position is I'm a professor of criminal justice at Metropolitan State University. And it's one of the state colleges here in Minnesota. And I'm also the head of the department. And what's unique about that job is, unlike most other places throughout the world, uh, instead of going to a police academy, uh, in Minnesota, you go to college. Mm. And so not only is it a regular university, it also sort of doubles as a police training facility. So that's the kind of regular day job is teaching undergraduate students, graduate students, getting them you know, set up on criminology, criminal justice stuff. Um, and at the same time, I'm the sort of co-founder and co-president with my colleague Gillian Peterson of The Violence Project. And The Violence Project is a non-profit organization that's based on research, uh, trying to advance kind of policy and practice around uh, mass shootings and violence reduction, um, and, and really just trying to get information in the hands of uh, the public so that they can make informed decisions about prevention and intervention when it comes to violence. And so those are the two main 
things that I'm kind of uh, engaged in at the moment. And well, the third one you've missed off is my church world. So when you know someone who is an international <laughs> expert, you've got to drag them into your world. So I do I do call you one of my advisors for Trudeau right. and WSA. So you're, you're a very talented guy. So, um, and so when we look at your time back in the in the UK, then it's funny because even since the time I've known you, you know, you were, well, I guess when I first knew you, you were known for group violence, you're a gang expert. Now you've reinvented yourself for sort of mass violence. Um, but in the UK, um, you know, you um, your sort of doctorate was around gangs. And really, you always joke and say you got your doctorate by hanging out with street gangs. But that's not too far from the truth, though, really, is it? <laughs> no, I suppose it's not. Yeah, it's funny. So it's actually a story that starts a little bit before even doing that research. So I was a PhD uh, graduate student at Oxford. But before I was even in the PhD program, I was in a master's degree program. And I met my now wife uh, at college then, and she's American, which is why I'm here in the United States right now. Yeah. And at the time, she was already scheduled to go to law school in the United States. So here we are in England trying to figure out this sort of new relationship. Are we going to stay together uh, or are we going to have a long distance relationship or how are we going to make this work? And in the end, I decided upon finishing my master's degree that instead of staying on for the PhD, I was going to follow her to the United States. And I did that. And we lived in New York for three years. And I had a degree in sociology, which qualifies you to do everything and nothing. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, what am I going to do in New York as a young guy, newly married, trying to figure out how this works? And I ended up getting a job as a teacher. I went through a training program that kind of certified me to be a teacher. And I taught in uh, a middle school in the Lower East Side of New York, New York City Public Schools. And uh, I was a special ed teacher for a few years. Amazing experience, loved it. It was, it was one of the just game-changing experiences of my life. But what was weird about it is that experience got me interested not in being a teacher forever, but in actually youth violence. Because some of my students were on the periphery of gangs. They had family members that are involved in, uh, in crime and in violence, and it was affecting their lives. And there was a lot of mythology around the gang as well, which fascinated me. So my old supervisors back in England said, well, if you'd ever turn around and come back and do a PhD, what would you want to do it in? And I sort of said, well, I'm quite interested in this gang thing now. And at that time, Oxford was launching a new institute on organized crime. And they said, well, that sort of fits. So we think we can figure this out. So once we'd uh, finished our time in New York, we moved back to the UK. And then I started doing this research on gangs. And as you say, I basically spent two, three years hanging out on street corners with drug dealers and gang members and going on rides along with the police and interviewing people on the, in communities to sort of see what was going on on the streets somehow got a PhD for doing that. Yeah. And the kind of rest is is really history in terms of becoming a, you know, a sort of a, a scholar that focuses largely on gangs and group violence uh, issues. And now when you're hanging out with these, because most um, gang members are actually quite young, aren't they? We imagine they're sort of like, and they like the Hells Angels, they're a bit sort of older and stuff, but most street gangs are sort of under 20 or younger, James, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, these were young people. And I think that's actually an important thing to remember is it's easy when you say the label gang member, it, it evokes all these kind of emotions and all these images, stereotypes really of what that person is. But the bottom line is they're young people. So these, these are teenagers. And so you're interacting with people who are in the late teens, early 20s, and are sort of navigating all the things that most people of that age are doing as well. It's just they have the additional pressures of the threat of violence in their communities and all the other things that are going on in their lives, trying to make ends meet often through illegal means, drug dealing and things like that. But at the end of the day, they're young people. And I think that was one of the most interesting takeaways from the research, which is that you have to see it through that lens, really, that these are young people and they're dealing with a lot of the same issues that many young people are dealing with, particularly in the age of social media and, and, and things like that, where their lives are sort of very much in public and they're trying to navigate those lives. Yeah, and I imagine, um, I'm going to stereotype you a little bit here, James, you know, but from a, you know, a, a very um, sort of middle-class, humble family in, in Leicester, in, in England, and you're hanging around with these sort of like street gangs, I mean, they, they must have been exposing you to things or saying things that 
um, you've either not seen before, or perhaps you know you're you're, you're closer to it than than what you than what you were. So, I mean, uh, how did you sort of deal with perhaps hearing about some of the violence they might have uh, been involved in, any of the initiations or any criminality? I mean, was there anything that really shocked you about what you saw? Yeah, it's a good, that's a really good point actually. So I think it's it's interesting because you know you hear you hear me talk, you see what I look like and, and uh, you know, Oxford educated and all that sort of stuff. And it evokes a sort of image of who I was, but I did grow up in a sort of a pretty working class, uh, sort of, you know, upwardly mobile uh, mm-hmm. l- life, but, um, you know, pretty diverse schooling experience and was exposed to quite a few things as, mm-hmm. as a kid. And so in that respect, it wasn't necessarily that shocking, but of course it was certainly the sharper edge of mm-hmm. these things. Um, and yeah, there were times where I don't think I ever felt kind of threatened with any of this, mm. but there were moments where you sort of sit back and think like, wow, how did I end up here? You know, like it's yeah. it's midnight and I'm in a car with a bunch of drug dealers and I'm interviewing them for the uh, f- for the assignment. And uh, and you just sort of have to take stock of like, mm. this is not really how I envisioned how I'd be spending my afternoon or my evening yeah. or anything like that. So yeah, I think there was an element of that. And I think in terms of the most shocking things, the level of violence that was just routine was almost not just shocking, it was sad. Um, that quite often these young people would talk about, you know, friends and family members who'd been shot, who'd been stabbed, who, um, you know, had been assaulted on the streets and, and, and everything else. And, and they would talk about it in a way that it was just so normal. Yeah. It was like, this is the expectation. If you grow up around here, you're going to get stabbed. If you grow up around here, there's an expectation you've got to be able to handle yourself because there's going to be violence and it's going to challenge who you are. And I think that was just sad to me. It was like growing up in those environments, you know, how can you ever expect these young people to succeed if in the back of their mind the whole time is that they've got to protect themselves in case they be assaulted by somebody else in the community. Mm. And at that time at sort of university and you're going, you're going, or you're going through this PhD, what age are you, James? So I think I started the PhD, I was, well, 27, something like that. So, so were you tw- ever- um, 26. So yeah. by, by now, you know, a lot of your friends are probably also either Oxford educated, college educated, going into professions and you're hanging around with these sort of, you know, drug, <laughs> drug dealers on, on the street corner and in the car of a Saturday night thinking, I sure as hell hope the police don't stop me here. How am I going to explain this? Yeah, I had to I had to literally like register my research study with the Metropolitan Police in London. I actually have letters from Scotland Yard wow. saying, you know, like if you see me on the streets, mm. I promise I'm a PhD student. I'm not ha- I'm not really not in the gang that, yeah. sort of thing. I mean, I, you know, you have to get those checks and balances. And then weirdly as well, you know, you can't just show up on the streets and say like, hi, I'd like to interview you. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah. it, they'd think I'm insane. And so a lot of it was around leveraging networks, you know, nonprofit organizations that were working on the streets, uh, other police officers, social workers, teachers, you know, going to barber shops and just talking to people in the community, going to churches, talking to people in the community, mm-hmm. and sort of saying like, hey, any chance you could introduce me to some of your friends or introduce me to people that you know? And that was around building trust in the community. But in the back of my mind that whole time, I was thinking, not only am I trying to like prove myself in this regard to the young people I'm interviewing, that I'm not some sort of undercover police officer that's going to you know, uh, expose them. Yeah. But then at the same time, I'm thinking, but if the police are watching me, which I knew they were because I was interacting with them, are they thinking I've got sort of alternative motives as well with this? And so you're always managing those kind of expectations with this type of ethnographic work. Yeah. And did you ever... Um think that you were, um, I'm going to be careful how I'm going to say this to you, I don't want to infer anything or, or lose your good name, but but you were perhaps getting too close, or maybe let me rephrase this, were you surprised how easy it was to relate to them and mm. become friends on, because I know within your book, you know, there's a lot of sort of um, pseudo names that are used, but I mean, in real life, you must have been either calling them by their street name. Were you surprised how easy it was to relate to these kids? Yeah, you know, it depended. It often depends on on the people. So there were some people that I would interview. I maybe only interviewed once, and I got the interview with that person, and we sat down, we talked, and it was very guarded, and it wasn't very, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily the best interview mm. in the world. And then there were others um, where I interacted with these people day in, day out for years. And you do build up a relationship with with these folks. And I guess on the one hand, I wouldn't say it was necessarily surprising, but I will say, I mentioned before, I was a school teacher before I went into this research. That was the best training possible because I spent 
two or three years hanging around with young people, learning how to interact with them, knowing what they're interested in, uh, finding ways to start conversation, um, and and make sure that the conversation doesn't just sort of die when you, 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 you're comfortable in the silences, all that type of stuff. And that was really, really helpful. If I hadn't had that experience, I have no doubt, A, I probably wouldn't even be studying gangs in the first place because it was, it was the teaching that got me interested mm -hmm. in young people. The second thing is, I would have never been able to do that research. I would have utterly failed in, in any attempt to like keep that conversation going, keep that work going. That was the best experience I could have possibly had. Yeah, and I didn't spend too long in uniform in the police, but I can remember when you're talking to your demographic, I mean, they were ruthless. I mean, they really were. And the best thing I found was to to laugh and joke about yeah. yourself to try and get that, get that rapport. If, if there's any sort of, um, a hierarchy between you and them, they're just going to close you down, you know. But it was so it was a it was interesting my time as a street cop working it's, with it's quintessentially like British, right? It's self deprecating humor, mm -hmm. um, not taking yourself too seriously, and really just letting them be themselves mm -hmm. and you just kind of letting them do that, observing that, asking the right questions, but not imposing yourself on, on their lives in, in those ways. And I think that was the balance. You're right though, because yeah. they can smell a fake from oh, a yeah. mile off. Oh, they really can. And if they feel like you're a threat in that regard, mm. or if you're being fake, not being authentic, trying to be something that you're not, it's game over. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and sometimes I mean there was people that I used to work with. They would see that, and and they would come back in a jovial way. But it, but it was it was fun for me to be an outsider, just seeing them instantly pick up that my partner was trying to be someone that they weren't. And it's like you know, look, you're you're middle class, you're upper class. You shouldn't be in the police force anyway. You know, please, it's a working man's profession. But you know, just just be yourself to these kids because they'll they'll pick you out. Yeah. So then you know, in the years that have passed, then so you're now um, nationally known here in the US. You know, internationally known for, for Europe and across Asia, and I think you've, you've been to a lot of continents where you've spoken about um, um, street gangs. So you know, you're this, you're this young boy from from Leicester. You know, you hang around with these uh, um, you know these street gangs. You know, you've got your PhD. You've you know, you've got a book on on street gangs, and now you're this sort of internationally known expert. I mean, how do you? What's that like to sort of to wake up and Google your name, James? And, you know, dot com comes up and all these sort of accolades and stuff. It's, it, you know, it's funny. But, you mean, again, it comes back to you can't take yourself too seriously. And, and you're kidding yourself if you think you're really, you know, that big a deal in the grand scheme of things or something. But it is it is a, a striking change, I guess, is the mm. big thing. You know, I'm a, I was a first generation college student. So uh, my parents never went to university. Mm. Uh, no one in my extended family had been to university before. Um, and so that alone was a big shift, I think, in mindset. And the truth be told, I spent most of my time in secondary school in the uh, headmaster's office. I was a I was a pain in the ass at sc in school. Like I was constantly getting myself in trouble. You're in good company, uh, James. <laughs> <laughs> well, great minds think alike. Yeah, yeah. But I think it was it is a big change. I think there are times when there's people like back home in Leicester who maybe I haven't seen in 20 years since we were at school. You know, and they're like, well, what are you doing nowadays? And I'm like, well, I'm a pr professor of criminology. And they look at me like, how on earth did that happen? Yeah. Um, and I ask myself that sometimes. And, I've, and I think the answer to that question is when I first started at university um, in Northampton, actually, was where I did my undergraduate degree. I had um, a really supportive friends that really kind of like kept me on the straight and narrow, because I think if I'd ended up in the wrong halls of residence in the wrong dorm room or something, yeah. it could have gone either way. So that's one thing I'm very grateful for. And then the second thing is I had uh, you know, tutors, professors in that degree that literally took me to a side and said, look, you're pretty smart if you apply yourself, but at the moment you're just wasting your time. And for whatever reason, it just resonated. And then they ended up becoming sort of mentors and really supporting my uh, goals in trying to get into graduate school and move through that process. And it just kind of built, built and built and built. And in many ways, it wasn't really strategic. It just happened. And, and I feel like I fell into it, got very lucky. And, uh, and here we are sort of, uh, sort of now. So there are those moments where you kind of like pinch yourself a little bit and think, not quite sure how I end up here, but I'm grateful that I ended up here. Um, and then it also kind of inspires you to want to keep pushing and doing a little bit more.
Yeah, and I know you, you said to me once, but and I think I've seen a lot of the stuff that you post on LinkedIn. There seems to be a profile surrounding what sort of gang experts look like. And I think you joked once and said, you know, you're all white guys with bald heads and stuff like that. You know, I mean, <laughs> is there, um, do, does your um, appearance or background or anything sort of give you more stature in the community? Um, I mean, like if you're a, a middle-aged white guy in his 40s or 50s, he's a, a gay expert. I mean, is it, are they treated differently in that profile to perhaps someone who's been out there and lived and, and worked with street gangs? Is, is there a difference? Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. Within the field, like within criminology, I think there is this sort of uh, split between qualitative ethnographic researchers and quantitative researchers who are using large data sets. Both are absolutely valuable, and we couldn't do the work we do without each. Uh, but the ethnographers seem to, like myself, who've been on the street stuff, they do seem to have a little bit more maybe um, uh, credibility or accessibility with practitioners because you feel like you're able to at least translate things into their language a little bit more because you can draw on the words of the gang members you've spoken to, which is a little bit different perhaps when you're you know, running statistical models and being able to sort of line these things up. But it's always a balancing act, I think, in that way. Um, so yeah, the field is a little bit strange in that, in that regard is, you know, you have some people who've really been there, seen there and done it, uh, and then you have others that perhaps haven't. And it, and it can create some conflict and some tension, unnecessary most of the time, uh, in the work that we do. Yeah, I guess some of that could be surrounding, well, you know, that's, that's just, that works good in theory, but in the real world. I mean, you get that in the police and all walks of yes. life, imagine stuff. You know? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You hear that a lot. Practitioners are sort of like, well, that's great, but what does that mean for us? And I yeah. think one of the skills with gang research is really trying to translate it to, into practitioners so they can actually use it. Um, and that's been, I think, over the last few years, one of the things I've really tried to do more is... Yes, it's great to publish in a journal and, and, and advance the field, but at the same time, you've got to make that work relevant to the practitioners so they can actually do something with it. And it's about getting that right balance. Yeah, and what about um, you as a person then, so working within sort of street gangs, what, what have you learned about yourself from, through from you know, doing your PhD to traveling the world? What have you learned about yourself from working with street gangs? I think you, uh, well, I think for a start, you humble yourself is is really the, the first thing that ends up happening. And the second thing is, it, it for me at least, it was that you don't, uh, you don't want to go in with too many preconceptions. And you essentially challenge all the things that you thought were real. Um, so this was a real learning experience for me more than anything else. Like it's easy now to be like, well, I'm the expert because I wrote the book. Yeah. But actually, the experts were the, the kids on the street, and they're the ones that taught me the things that I know. Yeah. And so I think a lot of it is about really humbling yourself and really opening yourself up to that learning, I think, is the key thing. And the other thing is, you know, the, you have to do a lot of deep work within yourself around those really thorny issues of things like race and gender because they really are prominent in the world of the gang. This is a very masculine world for a start, uh, and it's also a very racialized world. You know, the vast majority of young people I interviewed in London were uh, Afro-Caribbean, they were black. Um, I'm obviously a white guy. Um, there's some of those divisions and tensions that you have to navigate with this, which means you have to really put the work in on understanding around racism and inequality and everything else. And you know, it's all very well saying like, well, I have a PhD in sociology, I understand that. But do you? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you understand that? What you learned in the textbook versus how you actually see it on the streets is different. So I think in many ways, it's just opening yourself up to those types of types of things. Yeah, and I think that real life application is just key to so many things. I was joking to, um, someone, uh, I think it's going to be another podcast I recorded, but it's talking about, you know, who do you get, who do you get financial advice from? I get financial advice from rich people that are successful because <laughs> I want to be like you. You know, I don't go to one of my poor friends who's spending more money than his gone and say, hey, can you give me some advice as to how to start this business? You know, something. There is something to be said for practical application, but obviously, you know, textbook smart is, is also um, big, as, big as well. So, well, James, as we sort of touched on your schooling and your expertise in street gang, I'm just going to wrap up part one of our conversation. When we come back and we're going to dive into a bit more about what it's like to be a British guy here in America and yeah. your, your journey. Is. So, Dr. James Densley, thank you for joining me. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining the Who I Became podcast. 
to help spread this inspiring story, be sure to share it with your friends, hit the like button, and of course subscribe to our channel so you won't miss out on any future episodes. We'd also love to hear how this story impacted you, so leave a comment on whatever platform you're watching us from. To learn more about this episode, our guests, or Simon, head over to the Simon Osimo slash podcast and sign up to receive the latest information delivered straight to your inbox. Once again, thank you for joining us for the Who I Became podcast.